Thursday night viewers. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer. What? What's going on? Beg your pardon. Forgot to knock. And who are you? The name's Bond. James Bond. 007 himself? Yeah, one and only. Huh. Honestly, I thought you'd be, well, older. Nonsense. Who may I ask are you? The name's Gamer. Fairly Odd Gamer. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Game. And same to you. So, what brings you here? Well, a certain project of mine turned 25 this year, and as you're accustomed to movie tie-ins, I figured we might discuss about uh, myself. Hmm. I find it strange, but since you're here, I think it might work. Excellent. If you need me at all, I'll be outside fixing myself a martini. Shaken, not stirred. Fine by me. Anyway. Let's talk about James Bond. James Bond, a fictional British Secret Service agent known by his code number 007, was created in 1953 by writer Ian Fleming. He's appeared in a total of 12 novels and counting, as well as two short story collections. Even though Fleming died nine years after the creation of Bond, several more novels have been written and published, the latest release being With a Mind to Kill by Anthony Horowitz. It would also include spin off novels such as the Young James Bond series. Sort of like the one in here. I heard that and Diaries of Bond Secretary Moneypenny. Not only that, but he's also been adapted for television, radio, comic strips, and even movies with the first being Dr. No in 1962, with the late Sean Connery portraying the elusive agent. It was produced by a company called Eon Productions, which was run by Harry Saltzman and Albert R. Broccoli. Since Connery, five more actors would take on the role of 007, including Roger Moore, Pierce Brosnan, and current Bond Daniel Craig. The overall film series has grossed over $7 billion to date, making it the 5th highest grossing film series, only to be beat by Harry Potter, Spider-Man, Star Wars, and even Marvel. Not surprising. But this is a game I've been dying to talk about ever since I reviewed the GameCube preview DVD. Now that was refreshing. That's right, I'm going to be talking about James Bond 007 Nightfire for the GameCube. How coincidental, gamer. I wouldn't recommend that one if I were you. Okay. Um... How about James Bond for the Sega Genesis? What is a Sega Genesis? Is it sort of like a Mega Drive? Something like that, but okay then. How about this one? What is it? Goldeneye 007 for the Nintendo 64? Of course! Why did I think of that? It says to be one of the best tying games of all time! Mr. Bond, I like the way you think. Now let's get to it. Not so fast, James! Before we get into the game, allow me to talk about what the game is based on, a well-known movie from 1995 called GoldenEye. The 17th film in the Bond series, it was released in November 1995 with incredible acclaim by critics as well as audiences. Believe it or not, this is the first movie to have James Bond portrayed by Pierce Brosnan, and for a first-timer, I thought his performance was amazing. Not only that, but I thought the overall movie was fantastic with lots of action, comedy, plot twists, the works. I even love the opening sequence as well as the theme song performed by Tina Turner. Constantly ranked as one of the top three or four James Bond movies of all time, GoldenEye featuring Pierce Brosnan is a real smash hit, with extremely well developed characters, excellent action, and a very strong plot, you just can't go wrong with this movie. Plus, a normal tie-in game would be released around the same time as the movie's release, but in the case of GoldenEye 007, the game was released a year and a half after the movie's release. Surprisingly, it helped out in promoting the succeeding film, Tomorrow Never Dies, which would also get a PS1 game. And recently, it was announced that the game would get re-released for Nintendo Switch Online, as well as Xbox Game Pass, proving once and for all that Bond will never die. So does it still hold up after 25 years? Let's pop this baby in and find out. After seeing a spinning Nintendo logo, we see that the game was developed by Rare, best known for the Donkey Kong Country series at the time. After seeing the James Bond intro beautifully replicated in video game form as well as lots of characters, we then get a file select screen similar to that of Super Mario 64. And by the way, I really love this version of the James Bond theme. Once you load up a file, you have an option to select a mission and, hold on, select cheat? Yeah. Apparently, you can unlock cheats in this game, whether by finishing a level within a certain amount of time and a specific difficulty, or by putting in controller codes like everyone else would do. Some of them include DK mode, throwing knives, being invincible, and of course, the Dolden PPK gun. 
thus giving the new meaning of the man with the golden gun. Anyway, after selecting a mission, you get a choice of difficulty with agent being the easy mode, secret agent being the normal mode, and double O agent being the hard mode. And by the way, the difficulty you choose mostly affects the amount of missions you have to complete in order to finish a level. Speaking of which, you're given primary objectives as well as a mission background, a briefing from Leader M, played in the movie by Dane Judy Dench, additional info from the Q branch, and finally advice from Bond's secretary, Moneypenny. This leads to the first level of the game, The Dam, which is also where the movie starts off. It's a first person shooter similar to games like Virtua Cop and even Doom, although some might say that it inspired some of the Call of Duty games. Use the control stick to move, the Z trigger to fire, A to rotate your weapon, either the control pad or C pad to look around, and finally B to either reload your weapon or perform certain actions like opening doors. While the game doesn't have a tutorial, you can still find the game's controls in the pause menu. Mostly you start off with Jane's default gun, the PP7. However, you can obtain more weapons as well as more ammo by shooting enemy soldiers. And for the most part, the weapons they have are much stronger than yours. But try not to get hit too many times because the red half circle meter on your left is your health meter. And of course, losing all your health makes you die. Not only do you get the blood trip on the opening, but you also get a small cutscene of Bond's death. Luckily, the only way to protect yourself from gunfire is finding some body armor. Yes! I am invincible! Well, not quite, because the body armor is limited. You see that blue meter on the right side of your screen? That shows how much body armor you have left. But make sure you hold on to it because having body armor is absolutely vital if you want to beat this game. Before starting each level, you do get a description of each level with a small snippet of the level design. All you do is shoot enemy soldiers while escorting a truck filled with gas canisters, I think, and bungee dump off a dam as seen in this cutscene. Okay, but where's the bungee? It looks like he's performing a suicide dive to the inner realms of the underworld. Okay, not really, but you do get a mission report as well as statistics, which is pretty cool, but doesn't really affect anything otherwise. Anyway, we move on to the next level, the facility. It starts you off in the ventilation system where he drops into the bathroom. Beg your pardon, forgot to knock. You can actually shoot a soldier in the head while sitting on his throne. Other than that, just make your way to the laboratory, which you have to get a key from Dr. Doak, and to the bottling room. It's here where you run into Bond's partner, Alex Trevelyan, also known as 006. I actually like how the character lines are similar, if not on point, to the ones from the movie. Half of everything is luck, James. And the other half? Fate. Bond plays his mind onto the bottling tanks and blows them up as he makes his way to a conveyor belt to complete the mission. However, if you decide to stick around for a bit, you can watch Uromov capture and murder Trevelyan. But that wouldn't be necessary because Uromov would want to fire on you next. You can't win. On to the next level, the runway. It's here where you introduce to a new game mechanic, driving a tank. Honestly, it feels more awesome having Bond drive a tank and shoot turrets. Want to try something fun? How about literally running into these soldiers with said tank? Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Gamer. What do you care about more, the mission or your entertainment? <sighs> yeah, you're right. After finding the ignition key in one of the huts, run to the plane in order to escape. Up next, we have Service 1 in Severnaya. It's pretty simple, really. All you do is make your way to the satellite dish and power down the communication links. Once that's done, then jump into the base via ventilation tower. For those who are unaware, I'm playing this game on Agent, which is the easy mode. As I mentioned before, the hard difficulties make you complete more tasks in order to beat the level. Because that's what real double O agents do. Good point. This leads to the next level, Bunker 1. In this iteration, it's a small underground base in the middle of Siberia or the Sivernaya Plateau. As of now, it's under construction. It can only have a small amount of computer hardware in preparation for a program called GoldenEye. Also, it's here where you first meet computer programmer Boris, remarkably played in the movie by Alan Cumming. Yes! I am invincible! And let's be real here. He is my all-time favorite character in the entire movie. If you're playing in double-O agent difficulty, Bond is Boris to activate a computer in order to use a data thief device on it. But after finding a computer room key card, you have to analyze the Golden Knight key, dispose of it, and take a photo of the main video screen. Once that's done, exit the bunker without being shot down by enemy soldiers. Next up is the silo. Now before moving on, I'd like to point out that there are missions in which you have to limit casualties to citizens, or scientists in this case. In other words, Never shoot anybody that's unarmed. But going back to the story, Bond has to photograph the Golden Eye satellite and get to the elevator before the fuel room blows up. 
Moving on, we have the frigate, which holds the pirate stealth helicopter, which you can recall from the movie. All you have to do is rescue hostages from enemy soldiers and plant a tracker bug onto the helicopter. Pretty standard stuff, really. Next up, we have Surface 2. It's similar to Surface 1, only in the dark! Oh, and the sky is blood red. To be perfectly honest, this is one of those levels that I cannot stand for the life of me. Why? Because it's way too dark for my TV to handle. I had to yank out the brightness on my TV as a result. What's even worse is that I have absolutely no idea where to go or what to do. You know what this game really needs? A radar. Or at the very least, a map. At least you'll be able to know where you're supposed to go and what you have to do. Anyway, take out the security camera without being spotted and kill a commando that holds a satellite key. After that, make your way to the satellite and break the communications link to the bunker. Then follow the sound of the helicopter and enter another portion of the bunker. On to the next level, Bunker 2. We see Bond thrown in jail where he meets Natalia Simonova, who felt that she had betrayed her countrymen. Basically, she's the Bond woman in both the movie and the game. So after breaking both himself and Natalia out of jail, Bond has to retrieve and recover the CCTV tape hidden in the control room. Once you've done that, both you and Natalia have to escape the bunker again without getting shot down by enemy soldiers. By the way, if Natalia dies at any point, then that's it. You failed the mission. Oh, did I mention this game has no checkpoints? Because this game has no checkpoints. If that does happen, then you have to abort the mission and start over at the beginning of the level, no matter how far you've gotten. After escaping the bunker again, they have to Statue Park, which happens to be the next level of the game. First off, you have to find and meet ex kgb agent Valentin Tchaikovsky, played in the movie by Hagrid. You're an agent, Harry. What? An agent! He tells Bond to meet up with Janus by Lenin's statue, but be warned because he's a Lion's Cossack traitor. After Valentin leaves, Bond makes his way to the statue where he finds Janus, who is none other than... Alec, my old partner. That's right, Alec faked his death and became Janus. While his parents trusted the British government, they were betrayed by other Lane's Cossacks. Also, he left Natalia with a pirate helicopter, which he rigged to blow up in three minutes. Surprisingly, the same amount of time Bond had given Alec to live in the bottling room. But now, Bond has to face new enemies called Janus soldiers, armed with Amax shotguns. Anyway, Bond has to quickly find the helicopter and rescue Natalia before it explodes. Once that's done, he has to retrieve the helicopter's flight recorder and head on back to the park gates, where he runs into the defense minister, Dimitri Mishkin. He takes both Bond and Natalia to military intelligence headquarters for questioning about this Severnaya incident. This leads to the next level, the military archives. Bond gets arrested by GRU and puts them into separate rooms for interrogation. But luckily Bond can break out the interrogation room so he can kill more soldiers and find Natalia who is held in the room by the library. Anyway, they make their way to Minister Mishkin, who now knows that General Uamov was the traitor. After retrieving the helicopter black box from the safe, both Bond and Natalia escape via broken glass. On to the next level, the St. Petersburg streets. After breaking out of GRU headquarters, Bond has to endure a maze-like level with two different pathways. Plus, you can choose to travel on foot or by tank. Going on foot can be quicker, but be wary of Russian soldiers, some of them with rocket launchers. While driving in a tank is easier as well as being similar to the movie, try not to run into any civilians. Also, the same buildings appear throughout the level, and there's no present background when finishing the level. Also, when he finishes the level, Bond walks down the road with cars exploding behind him. It's actually pretty cool. Next level, the depot. This place is filled with disused hangars as well as abandoned buildings, and also covered in gloom. Best my luck. An area that best fits to my liking. Too bad it's really far away from me. <sighs> oh well. Tough luck, I guess. All you have to do is find civilians to murder missile train and get on board. All aboard the murder train! Toot toot! Coincidentally, the train that you go on happens to be the next level of the game. It's a linear level in which you start at the back of the train and work your way forward while shooting more enemy soldiers, as well as destroying all the brake systems. By the way, I always love shooting with dual weapons because at least you'll be more accurate with your shots. Eventually, you'll find Natalia being held hostage by Uromov, accompanied by Trevelyan and Exania Unatov, played in the movie by Famke Johnson. But you better be quick because waiting too long causes Natalia to die, and you know what that means. Anyway, shooting Uromov spares Natalia, who finds out the fourth and the antenna cradle for Goldeneye is located in Cuba. But before doing so, they have to escape the train by using a watch laser to destroy the locked hatch. For the longest time, I couldn't even get past the locked hatch because I would mostly be out of laser ammo before I could even escape. But heed my advice. 
Make sure you don't waste your ammo and keep your aim. Luckily, they do escape as the death train explodes to oblivion. This leads to the next level, the jungle. While it is a bit dark, it's not as dark as the second surface level. Thank goodness for that. While you do defeat enemy guards as well as these drone guns or auto guns that automatically shoot you if you're ever too close to them, it's actually cool to see Natalia kick some butt as well. I always knew I could trust her. Eventually they encounter Xenia armed with an RCP-90 and a grenade launcher. Too bad she can't kill anyone by physical contact. Just shoot her multiple times or throw a mine at her until she's defeated. By the way, this may be the only level where there's no music. Only the ambience of jungle noises. Well, except for when you face off Xenia or escaping via elevator. By the way, the remaining drone guns can be found in the back way, so exploration is key at this level. Okay, this next level, the Yanus Control Center, I can never beat this level even if my life depended on it. Well, my life depended on it, and I beat it in Cuba back in 95. This is one of the hardest levels I've ever played in this game. It starts you off at the underground control center where you clear Natalia from enemy soldiers as she makes her way to the control console in order to open up one of the doors, take out some enemy soldiers as well as some hand mines, and you'll eventually run to Boris once again who drops his handgun claiming that Trevelyan made him do it, as he says was perhaps my favorite line in the entire movie. I am invincible! Gosh, I love that line. Be sure to find some body armor in a bunker where Boris runs off to as he... vanishes? Okay. With the landmines bond found, he can destroy most of the armored mainframes by throwing a mine at them and detonating them in the process. Eventually, Natalia enters the control center as she tries to reprogram the remaining GoldenEye satellites to crash. And this leads to the most infamous part in the entire game, and probably the most difficult. You have to defend Natalia by shooting enemy guards scattered around the area. They appear randomly and you have no idea where these guards are going to pop out of. And as I mentioned before, the mission will automatically fail and Natalia ever dies. This has happened to me every single time. Why? Why? Can you see why I don't like this section at all? I didn't like it much either when Forrest was fingering that stupid Q branch pen. Fair enough. So if you somehow manage to protect Natalia from enemy guards, she will have finished the satellites. As a result, Bond sends Natalia back to the surface while he tries to go after Trevelyan. Eventually, he does find Trevelyan in another elevator, which is where Bond heads off to. On to the next level, the caverns, which all takes place underground. Like the jungle level, it's pretty much straightforward. As Bond makes his way through catwalks and a swirling ledge that leads to a room, Bond has to retrieve key cards from guards in order to gain access to specific rooms. Also, this is another level in which you have to spare the scientists. So after retrieving the key cards, as well as destroying the radio communicator, he finds Trevelyan again only to escape via elevator, and that's exactly where Bond heads off to. This leads to the final level of the game, the antenna cradle. Before you start, make sure you turn around because there's body armor behind you. Then you can show off enemy guards as well as those camera guns called auto guns. Because Natalia sent the alignment path of the satellites off course, Trevelyan uses the backup console to realign the satellites. This gives Bond some time to destroy the console. Once that's done, it's time for the final stretch. You vs Trevelyan. It starts off by chasing after him and shooting him once he stops. And yes, he does save lines from the movie while doing so. After enough time passes, both Bond and Trevelyan make their way to a tiny platform for the final encounter. Bond shoots off Trevelyan as he falls to his death and Bond escapes via helicopter. The game ends with Bond and Natalia hugging and kissing as the credits roll. There are other levels in this game such as Aztec and Egyptian, but they can only be unlocked if you manage to beat the game in the harder difficulties. And now it's Golden Eye 007 with the N64. I hope you enjoyed it because- Wait, you haven't talked about the most important part, the part that made it popular in the first place. Oh yeah? What's that? The multiplayer! The what? The multiplayer! I'm sorry, what? I think he means multiplayer, dude. Oh, thanks, Hux. Wait, Hux? What are you doing here? Oh, sorry, gamer. I was wondering if... Uh, gamer? Yeah, Hux? Who is that next to you? Sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. The name's Bond. James Bond. I see. Well, nice to meet you, Mr. Bond. The name's Hux Gamer, but you can call me Hux. Very honored to meet you, Hux. Anyway, we were just getting ready to talk about the multiplayer of- GoldenEye 007? That's awesome, dudes! I'm gonna play this game with my friends when I was a pup! Well, I hope you enjoy it! Wait, Hux. If you like, maybe you can play with Mr. Bond here. What do you say? Gamer, I would be honored. But I'll let you go first. James, would it be alright if Hux joined us for a moment? Of course. The more the merrier. Awesome, dudes! 
With that said, let's talk about the game's multiplayer. This is one of the main reasons why this game was added to Switch Online and possibly Xbox Game Pass, the multiplayer. With two or more players, multiplayer will be activated. And in my opinion, this is why the game is so memorable. You have five total modes to choose from, and you can choose from one of 24 characters, whether it's a character from the movie, a civilian, or an enemy that you shot down. In addition, you can choose one of 10 courses, what types of weapons to use, and decide either a time limit or a stock limit. Once you're ready, it's time for battle to commence. But hold on, so there is a radar in this game. The only downside is it's only available in multiplayer. So I ask you this, why wasn't there a radar added to the single player version? Let's start off with normal mode. It's you against your opponent as you try to shoot down as many of your opponents as possible within a time limit or try to get a certain amount of kills first. Normal mode is basically your standard first person shooter combat type of game. You have all the different guns available and it's multiple point, multiple hits to kill, depleting health points over time. Up next we have You Only Live Twice. As the name implies, each person has two lives. Last one standing wins. This one's a little more complex. You need to carefully budget your lives and body armor to stay with a fighting chance. Moving on we have the living daylights. It's basically who can hold onto a white flag the longest. But here's the catch. Once you have the flag, or token as the game calls it, you do not have access to any of your weapons. So that can give your opponents the chance to try and shoot you down and snatch the flag from you. This round is designed to have four players, two people on each team because you need one teammate to defend yourself while holding the flag. As you can see here, I'm completely defenseless while this crazy kid is shooting me full of holes. So in a situation like this, the one holding the flag would have to master the Joestar secret technique. <laughs> oh, sure sounds like fun. Mind if I cut him for a moment? Sure thing, Hux. Excellent! Hello, Mr. Bond. Hello, Hux. Let's finish the multiplayer. All right, so next we have the man with the golden gun. The object of this game is to find the golden gun and shoot down your opponents. The good news is you can kill your opponents in one shot with it. The bad news is you only have a limited amount of ammo. So strategy is key once you get a hold of it. The golden gun has a very slow reload speed, single shot magazine. So if you miss, you're in for a lot of trouble. The main idea of the golden gun is one player picks up the golden gun and every other player on the board hunts down this one player until he's dead. Then the next player picks up the golden gun and it continues as such. Finally, we have license to kill. This is definitely my favorite mode in all multiplayer. Any shot at your opponent will result in its death. You can rank up many kills that way or just have a quick battle. I agree. It's the most like real combat. In real combat, you can't take 50 RCP-90 slugs to the chest and walk away. License to kill, it's very simple. If you're shooting in the general vicinity, you probably won't survive. It's the easiest way to rack up a large number of kills in the shortest amount of time. If you don't have a very long time to play, this is probably the scenario you want to use. Or just do what I do and hide in one area and wait for your opponents to arrive. This is called camping. It's not recommended. In fact, it can even earn you the achievement most dishonorable, as my friend did here. Yes! I'm invincible! Amazing. You sure seem to know a lot about gaming, Hux. Well, dudes, I learned a lot from Gamer here, but man, that was fun! Nice meeting you, James. Pleasure to meet you, as always. Thanks! Anyway, later, dudes! Well, Mr. Gamer, what did you think of it? You know, after 25 years, I think it still holds up as one of the best tying games of all time. Can't argue with you on that. Well, it is challenging to say the least, at least it's still a fun game. Graphically, it's amazing. Most if not all the levels match the sets from the movie, and I think they look superb. Even some of the levels that weren't shown in the movie look amazing as well. The characters look like they were ripped straight from the movie. As for the gameplay, it feels awesome getting to shoot people as Bond, and I think this game does a good job of making you feel like an agent. I love being able to change your weapons as well as taking weapons from dead soldiers. I even love driving the tank like what you see in the movie. Even though I have some gripes with one or two things, I don't think it affects my experience in any way, shape, or form. I also get a kick out of the game's music by Graham Norgate and the legend behind the soundtracks for Donkey Kong 64, Banjo-Kazooie, and the 2013 remake of Castle of Illusion, Grant Kirkhope. Overall, Golden 007 is, in my opinion, the textbook example of how a video game tie-in should be. 
It perfectly follows the movie's story with a few changes, and it provides a wonderful experience for players of all ages. Whether you're a Bond fan or not, this is one game I would definitely want you to add to your game collection. This game, with excellent graphics, excellent mechanics, and a great sense of being in the fight, was way ahead of its time for 1997. This game is a classic feature of many tournaments, battles, and even just home entertainment. It's so much fun, it works so simply, and it's so simple there's no exploitable cheats that we found yet. This game is just pure fun for one to four players. This is an excellent way to kill an afternoon. I give it my strongest recommendation. And thus, we finally reached the end of one of the best licensed games of all time. I hope you enjoyed it because I sure did. And thank you, Mr. Bond. Mr. Bond? James? Where did he go? Right here. Whoa! How'd you do that? Simple. In order to be a secret agent, you have to be stealthy. I see. Well, thanks for helping out anyway. It's always a pleasure, Mr. Gamer. Hope to see you again soon. Of course. See you later, Mr. Bond. Take care, Mr. Gamer. This is going to be a very interesting season. I'm the Fairly Odd Gamer, and I wish you all good luck the rest of your day or night, wherever you are. Take care, everyone. Bye. How's it going, dudes? Hux Gamer here. Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon if you want to get notified for upcoming videos. Well said, Hux. Also, be sure to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and some of my character buddies on TikTok. And if you'd like, you can have one of my character buddies do a short video for you via video commission. Links to all of those in the description below. And so, without further ado, I wish that one of my character buddies finished the video. Hey there, folks. It's me, Sonic. Sonic the Hedgehog. If you liked what you saw and want to help support the channel, then be sure to check out the Fairly Odd Gamer on Patreon. As a supporter, you can chat with everyone who helped out, as well as other fans, have your name in the credits, and even watch some bonus content such as sneak peeks and even early showings of upcoming game reviews. With that said, it's my honor to present this month's shout out to Luke Jeffers. Thanks a bunch for watching this video, as well as supporting the channel.